You got Mega Mac here on Birds 365, and we're lucky enough to get Gary Myers, longtime NFL uh, reporter and NFL author, here with us on Birds 365. All right, we got to be getting close to this giant book that you're releasing, Gary. Uh, we've had you on a couple times since, and we're we're sneaking up on the release date. How much closer are we to it? Well, I mean, close enough that uh, I got the cover behind me now that you yeah. can see. Uh, September 12th. Nice. Uh, um, I'm really excited about this one. As I've told you guys, uh, I think this is the best book I've written and certainly the most important because it, you know, tackles that really crucial subject of life after football for guys who are in their fifties and sixties. And there are just so many compelling stories in this book. Nice. And I love, I, I love the uh, cover there, Gary. It looks tremendous. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, we'll certainly be first in line uh, but let's talk about, before we get to that, and I want to talk to you about the book, let's talk about uh, the NFCs today. Um, Jody and I were just going back and forth. Dallas Cowboys, interesting team to me, I think, and you've been around this league. This is how I describe it. Now you have the, the great Cowboys, the Landry, Stallback Cowboys, the Jimmy Johnson Cowboys. Those were great, great teams. <clears throat> but America's team, my thesis is that the Cowboys are usually a little bit more overrated. In other words, people think they're a little bit better than they are typically because of their reputation, mm -hmm. America's team and all that kind of stuff. I think this is a pretty good team, though, right now. Um, you think they're overrated now or, or, or thought of just where they should be? Well, when when you say over, are people picking them for the Super Bowl? You think? Well, there's a lot of people saying, you know, they might win the NFC East uh, over the Eagles. There's a lot of people saying they're a Super Bowl contender, so they're in the mix with the Eagles and 49ers in the NFC. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, that they, you know, annually they are overrated because they are the Cowboys. I think they're underachievers. <laughs> um, I don't trust Dak Prescott to this point in a, in a really big spot um, losing to the 49ers two years in a row in the playoffs. I mean, last year I understood 49ers were a better team the year before he lost to him at home. Um, I heard you guys talking on in your previous segment about cooks and Gilmore. I mean, Gilmore for a five and cooks for a five and a six. I, I think you have to make, make both those trades considering where their roster was at. They really needed a second corner. I do think Michael Gallup will be better this year than he was last year. Coming second year back off the ACL, the guys usually are closer to where they were uh, than they are the first year after coming off that surgery. So they might have had the answer right there uh, with with Gallup, but every team needs three receivers. And, and yep, yep, never a bad thing, Gar. Yeah, yeah, and I, Joe, I, I don't understand. Like, I heard you guys say also, I think, John, you said it, like this guy gets traded every year. It seems yeah, like. I don't get it. I don't get it. He Cows produces yeah. almost every year, and he gets traded yeah. every year. Yeah. And the value keeps going down. I mean, the guy was a first-round pick. He gets traded to the Patriots. I think he was for a one. Uh, and then he's just bounced around ever since. And it, it doesn't make any sense to me. He's a quality player. Um, more of a short. And usually you get, Gary, real quick, usually mm -hmm. when that happens, it's a bad guy. All indications. He yeah. gets a tra he's a decent guy, good, good teammate. You know, it's the weirdest thing ever, and he keeps producing and keeps getting traded. You know, my my issue with the Cowboys, John, really is not necessarily their personnel. It's the coaching. Uh, Mike McCarthy is now going to be the play caller. Now, I was not crazy about Kellen Moore, even though they always put up great numbers. Um, but McCarthy and Aaron Rodgers really clashed towards the end in Green Bay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of it had to do over the play calling, I believe. And now after not doing it for, what is McCarthy's fourth year in Dallas now? I think that's what it is. Yeah. I think, yeah, the pandemic, I think, was his first year. Yeah. Right. Um, so now after being away from calling plays since his last year in Green Bay, which was 2018, you know, are we, are we thinking that was the missing piece to, you know, getting the Cowboys over the, to the next level? I, I don't know. I, I'm not crazy about McCarthy as a head coach, either as a game manager and now going back to being a play caller, mm. I do know that I have more confidence in Dan Quinn and their defense than I do in McCarthy 
and their offense, although you have to go back to that Super Bowl where it was Dan Quinn's defense that blew that 20 yeah. Yeah. In the Super Bowl. So <clears throat> I don't know. I, I think going into the training camp, at least, and things can change so much over the summer with one key injury. But, you know, the Eagles are clearly the best team in the division. Um, I think Washington is clearly last. But this has been a division that over the years um, – you can kind of put a blanket over it and shake it up or whatever and pull somebody out. And it could be any of the four teams. Um, I think the giants will be better than, you know, just watching them play against the Eagles in the, in the playoffs last year. You can't say that they've closed the gap <clears throat> enough that they're going to beat them in a similar situation, but uh, the giants could be better this year, but not have as good a record. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you about the, yeah, the record. Is, their, their schedule is much tougher. Yeah. I think they are going to be better. But they're not going to win as much, and that's yeah. always a, yeah. um, a difference. I mean, obviously, problem. they guys obviously they've put all their faith in Daniel Jones. I thought he made major improvements last year, but fifteen touchdown passes. Now you can, you can say that's a function of not having the weapons, and that's partly true. But is that just who he is? He was actually he throws a really nice ball, and he's very dangerous with his legs. I mean, I think he's one of the better running quarterbacks in the league. And now, you know, with Darren Waller and they drafted Jalen Hyatt, Hyatt in the third round from Tennessee, <clears throat> who's got Tyreek Hill-type speed. Whether he's that kind of player, we'll find out. But, you know, he was drafted higher than Hill was, so maybe he turns out to be the kind of player, and they hit the jackpot on that. But they, they do have an issue with, with Barkley. He does not want to play in a franchise tag. They're coming into the last month of either he takes it um, – or he holds out, and, and if uh, once they get past, I think it's July 17, something like that, they yeah. can't sign him to a long term, long term contract. I know the Giants would like to sign him, but now their offer is is what I've heard is less than it was at the trading at the trading deadline last year. So it seems to be going backwards and further away from a deal. But you know, this is a deadline league, and nothing happens until it has to happen. And so we'll see what happens there. We'll keep an eye on the Giants running game. Since you brought up running game, I guess I'm going backwards to the Cowboys. I know he rushed for under four yards per carry last year, first time ever in his career. But I think the Cowboys are going to miss Ezekiel Elliott. He did score 12 touchdowns. There, there is an art to that inside the 10, the ability to get inside the end zone. He's pretty damn good at it last year, and you're subtracting 12 touchdowns. Now, Pollard's a stud, and they gave him the franchise tag and uh, made sure that he stayed so they could move away from Zeke. Ronald Jones, uh, Vaughn, the kid they took in, what, the fifth or sixth round, the coach's son who made the yeah. team. I like it's him. But son, yeah. Yeah. I think his game is a lot like Pollard's. He's not a between-the-tackles, no, driving-in-the-end-zone kind of guy. Yeah. yeah, He's a small guy. Um, I mean, you can't completely rule out the possibility of them bringing him back on a minimum contract. I'm talking about Zeke. Um, there's been no indication to this point that that's what the Cowboys want to do. But despite Zeke having a wish list of teams that he would sign with, nobody <laughs> stepped up to sign him. No. Yeah. So, well, you know, it comes right down to it. It could be a matter of the Cowboys feeling a little desperate of getting a proven running back. Ronald Jones has bounced around a bunch. Uh, I don't know how durable Pollard's going to be as as the main as the number one running back. And, and you're right. I mean, scoring touchdowns from inside the two is an art. A lot of teams have problems with it. Um, and there is something to be <laughs> even if that's all he does. I mean, there's been players in this league who have been used as a specialty back on short yardage and then goal line situations. So maybe – now, I saw Elliott play a bunch last year. I'm sure you guys did, too. Without question, he didn't lose one step. He lost two. And um, he cannot be an every down back anymore. I mean, he just had so many carries and so many hits over the years that he got worn out. That's why investing in running backs has become something teams don't want to do because yeah. his life is so short. But I think he can still be a useful player in specialty situations. Yeah. Yeah. Um... The Eagles, scary, obviously, uh, and deservedly so, are still considered uh, the front runners uh, in the NFC. But there's been 
a lot of change, especially defensively. And also with the coaching staff, I think, you know, that continuity of Nick yeah. Sirianni's first year to his second year, now you don't have that anymore. You, you lost both coordinators. They lost uh, uh, the secondary coach. They lost the linebackers coach. They have six new starters on defense projected. Um, that's a lot of And change. they're all from Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> well, that part's not bad. Yeah. No, it's, if it's, it's Jalen Carter, yeah, that. yeah. Uh, that part's not bad. Nicobe Dean, tremendous potential, but that's what it is, potential. He played 34 reps last year on the defensive yeah. side of the football. I was surprised they didn't get him on the defense in on defense more yeah. last year. I mean, um, yeah. But the, the change, and you've been around this league a very long time. Jim Schwartz used to call it uh, startup costs. I use that term because I love that term. There's startup cost everything in this league, and there's generally some hiccups when you have that much change. Is it fair to say, ah, it's going to be fine? Well, I look at it like this. In the pre-free agency days, I think that was true because there was so much continuity overall. So if you lost a couple of coaches, yeah. then you know it became a real problem. Now – there's so much turnover in personnel on every team on a year to year basis that I think sometimes it takes three or four games, even if the coaching staff is intact before, you know, who you are before this continuity with the new players. Now, obviously throwing new coordinators into this mix, especially on defense where you said there's six new starters creates, you know, more of a learning process and a getting to know you process. But I I didn't look at either the, any of those coordinators as saying, geez, you know, they, they just lost Belichick like when the Giants did as a coordinator or, you know, Buddy Ryan just left Chicago and now their defense was totally changing. I mean, those were good coaches, but it's not like I looked at the Eagles and said, you know, they have an unbelievable coaching staff that if you break them up, they're not going to survive. And now you guys are closer to it than me, so you might disagree but um, I don't think those were irreplaceable coaches. All right. Well, and I'm going to put you to test on those guys. Under over comparison. Eagle wins this year versus wins by the two coaches they <laughs> lost combined. Colts and Cardinals together versus Eagles. Who wins more? Well, the Colts could have the first two picks in the draft next year. Yeah. Right. Uh, are the Colts the other team? Uh, the Cardinals, I'm saying. Did I say the Cardinals. Colts? Yeah, the Cardinals. But do the Colts also have two high ones? There's another team that is going to have potentially two really high ones next year. Uh, I can't remember who else traded down. Um, no, the Colts just stayed where they were and took Richard. Yeah, somebody yeah. else Somebody else has somebody else's – well, whatever. To answer your question, um, no, the Eagles will have – you might be able to multiply – Cardinals <laughs> and come up with the Eagles total. I mean, four times three is 12, and the Eagles could win 13. <laughs> so. Colts get four, and uh, the Cardinals get two. That's eight. The Eagles get yeah. nine, no problems. There you go. Now, now yeah, that's four times three, Jody, 12, the Eagles got to win 13. Now right. you got yourself a race. So Now, huh. that should be your question now to future guests, not add it together. <laughs> just say when Myers was on, he said, multiply it, multiply it. <laughs> now I do think, you know, people, I, I don't know where this ship. Well, I do know where it shifted Gary. Um, Kyler Murray, you know, if you remember a couple of years ago, the Cardinal, I think they got off to a nine and O start. He was the, mm -hmm. um, the, the toast of the league, the next superstar quarterback. And now I feel like, and he's coming off a torn ACL. Don't yeah. even know when he's going to be back. Exactly. But I, I feel like people are sleeping on him. He is uh, – th there's some issues. We know this. Uh, but he makes plays when he's out there. And I think he's the kind of guy who, if he's healthy, he's going to win games. He's going to pull a you-know-what out of his you-know-what and win a game here and there. And I don't know. What happened? We, we Everyone thought Kyler was going to be – a star quarterback, he signs the big contract, 
yes, the injury is a concern, but guy makes plays. Yeah, but I, I think it's been trending downwards for him since they lost that playoff game to the Rams a couple of years ago where he was just god-awful. Um, and then I, I don't know if it was two years ago with his new contract and they wanted to put that study hall clause yeah, in there. Yeah, that was last year, yeah. yeah. yeah that was Yeah, and I think that sent a message around the league that this guy's not a hard worker or a hard studier, even if they tried to say that wasn't their intent and then they took the clause out. So you start to develop a reputation like that. And then, you know, he and Kingsbury were supposed to have a special relationship. And it looked like that soured. Kingsbury gets fired. Uh, the Cardinals have a bad season and Murray gets hurt towards the end. And like you said, we don't even know when he's, if he's going to be back this year. They might have a whole season with uh, Colt McCoy for all we know. Um, they're going to be really bad. The, the Cardinals are going to be really bad. Uh, J.J. Watt is gone, so there goes the leadership. DeAndre Hopkins is gone. There goes a playmaker. I Buda mean, Baker I, I, I doesn't really want to be there. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where their wins are coming from. I haven't studied there. You know, they play in a in a in a division where you know you have one really good team in the 49ers. Um, Seattle's definitely getting better. They made the playoffs last year. I think the Rams, you know, are kind of in a rebuilding stage, but. Um, yeah, I don't look for much from the Cardinals. And um, and I'd say the same thing about the Colts. At least with the Colts, you say, you know, they have a what potentially is a really good, exciting young quarterback in Anthony Richardson, who is getting a lot of praise for his leadership in, in the offseason. And I think they'll probably play him right away and, and and try to get the you know the bumps in the road out of the way early. And you know, they'll have a bad season. They won't win a lot of games, but at least if they can start to develop him. Then you say, all right, you know, things are looking good going forward. With Kyle Murray, even when he gets back, you're saying, well, the last time he played, he wasn't very good. You know, so where are you going from there? He really wasn't. Um, and oh, by the way, I think Seattle can be a top four team in the a a a NFC this year. Uh, we had uh, Martin Frank on earlier. He liked the Lions. He put the Lions with the Cowboys, as a matter of fact. I think <laughs> Seattle's got a better chance than Detroit to take that jump up. Yeah, the Lions are a very trendy pick this year. Yeah, a little bit. Well, I think it has to do with the division. Minnesota's coming down. Green Bay lost Rodgers. Chicago's not ready. Somebody's got to win that division. Yeah, and the Lions finished up strong last year. Yeah. You yeah. know, on top of that. And you're right, the division. Um, you know, Minnesota might have one more run in them, in, which I think is going to be uh, Kirk Cousins last year, unless you can get them deep into the playoffs. Yeah. Um, I don't understand the Dalvin Cook stuff. I heard you guys talking about that earlier either, also. I mean, why? I know it's, it probably centers around money, but to me, he's still a really good running back. He is. He is. And, That's one of those things where Jody and I were talking about it uh, yesterday, Gary. You go from old school general manager Rick Spielman to new school uh, Kwesi Odopa Mensa, and they don't want to pay the position. And he pigeonholed himself early in the process. He re-signed Madison to starting running back money. Yeah. Now he's got no leverage. You either got to release him or. Yeah. That, that's, you know, I think that's a, a mistake. A lot of young GMs make in this league is, you know. They well, it's, it's the um, Harvardization of sports. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right, you bring. I think these... he's a Harvard guy. He's a he's a he's an Ivy League guy. I think it's Harvard, but yeah, I'm not sure. But just in general, and it's ruined baseball, and it could ruin football. <laughs> just, I'm with you on baseball. Yeah, I mean, instead of like uh, uh, one of the great things that Parcells always said, and I can quote him forever because he was just full of them, but full of them, not full of it. Um, it I go by what I see, yeah. and what I saw out of Dalvin Cook last year was still running back that. Um, that you're wanting your team if you want to make, um, you know, a deep run into the playoffs. But right. the analytics tells you not to pay a running back after he's been in the league a few years, and and it's an interchangeable position. Yeah. I think the Shanahans have had a lot to do with that because Mike was able to plug anybody into Denver and get 1,500 yeah. yards out of him, and, and yeah. Kyle's kind of done the same thing. Although Kyle – kind of went off track there but because they gave they up a lot Christian. yeah yeah exactly yeah 
Questions from Princeton, by the way. I want to give Princeton love. He's a Princeton. Princeton okay, guy. Ivy okay. League, but uh, in yeah. Jersey rather than up in Massachusetts. Yeah. All right. Got a text uh, while we were talking uh, from uh, Gardner Minshew said, tell Gary Myers, I haven't taken a dump all off season. I'm not doing uh, number two to go to Indianapolis. That was uh, a great quote gonna, from Gardner. Going to keep uh, that uh, Richardson wait, guy have, on the bench. Run that, uh, run that by me again. He, Gardner Minshew said what? Yeah, you might not know it. Oh, um, that is a great quote. Uh, I give it to him, John. Um, but uh, when when Jacksonville drafted Trevor Lawrence, um, obviously it was clear Trevor Lawrence was right. going to be the number one quarterback. But Gardner's a very competitive uh, guy, yeah. very, and he said, um, "I don't take dumps anymore because <laughs> he didn't want to hear the number two. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that so, and a very competitive guy. Remember when he beat the Jets? Uh, Jalen Hurts was hurt. Yeah, uh, I remember in that. Twenty twenty one. He played very well. He went into Nick Sirianni's office the next day. What do I have to do to win the starting job? And Nick was like, eh, settle, <laughs> settle not, not happening. Yeah. Go take a number two. But I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Well, at least John got a kick out of it. Guy didn't know the joke behind it. So, uh, sorry, right, Joe. My bad. All right. Uh, an unquestioned number one is what I got to ask you about, Mr. Myers. Someone asked me the other day, is Aaron Rodgers going to be Brett Favre 2.0 for the Jets? It was one of my Jet fan buddies. And I specifically said no for one reason and one reason only. With that. It seems to me like, and you tell me if I'm wrong because you're up there, New York papers, New York television stations every single day, but uh, from here in South Jersey, it seems like Aaron Rodgers is committed to the Jets, that he really wants to win, that he chose the Jets as much as the Jets chose him and showing up for OTAs, something he didn't be bothered with when he was up in Green Bay. Brett Favre knew he was coming to the Jets for one year and he was going to get the hell out and go to Minnesota. That's where he really wanted to be. That's where he wanted to go. Favre seems committed to uh, Favre. Rodgers seems committed to the Jets, and that's why I have more optimism over Aaron Rodgers with the Jets than I did with Favre with the Jets. Do I just have jet-colored glasses on? No, I think you're right. Not only has Rodgers gone to the OTAs, he went to two Taylor Swift concerts at MetLife yeah, Stadium. Uh, yeah, how about that? Plus Nick and Ranger <laughs> games. Um, when the Jets got Favre in 2008, the Packers thought they were trading him to Siberia, which is basically what it was. They were not going to trade him within the NFC. It came down to the two teams that made offers were the Bucks and, and the Jets. And, and Brett wanted to go to Minnesota, but there was no way they were doing that. Then he, he said, okay, I'll go to Tampa. And they said, nah, we're going to trade you to the Jets. What people forget is the Jets were eight and three with Favre. Yeah, they and they had just fun. come off back-to-back -back victories on the road in New England and Tennessee when the Titans, I think, were undefeated at the time. Um, so they were eight and three. And it looked like good things were about to happen. And then Brett hurt his arm. We were never told about it. I'm not sure how much the coaches knew about it to, until the end of the season. He wanted to keep his consecutive game streak alive, uh, wound up having surgery after the year. Uh, the Jets finished 9-7, and seven and he was out of here. He retired and then signed with the, the Vikings. You know, there was a clause in that contract, in the, in the trade agreement, when uh, the Packers sent Favre to the Jets, that if the Jets turned around as the middleman and then traded him to Minnesota – the Jets would have had to give Green Bay, I think it was either two or three number one picks. <laughs> so it was quite a poison pill that prevented them yeah. from trading him to the Vikings. <clears throat> Rodgers definitely wants to be here. The Jets were desperate to have him because of the Zach Wilson disaster. Um, I, I, I think this will work as long as he stays healthy. He is totally committed to the organization. Um, he is re-energized, even though it's only OTAs. There's a buzz around the building. Strictly because he's there. Uh, he's doing a really good job um, integrating himself in the locker room, going to games with different teammates to get to know everybody. He's like, he's like I mean, if you're going to embrace a new city um, and want to get into the culture of a city, there's no better place to come to than New York, especially after you spent all those years in Green Bay. And, I mean, he loves it. And the fans yeah. love him, but with the, you know, they opened Monday night against the Bills. 
if he throws an end zone interception with the Jets down by four uh, in the last <laughs> few seconds of the game, everything, all bets are off. Yeah, I had to go there. You had to go there. Well, right now, is, I know how you feel about them, Joe. Um, right now is a very prolonged honeymoon period. Um, he's made a commitment here in the offseason to be around his teammates. He knows the offense because he and Nate Hackett basically – um, yeah, came up with that offense. In Green the Bay. happiest guy in the world, Nate Hackett. He oh, I know. Sit in the corner, and <laughs> uh, yeah, really, just let um, Aaron drive the car. Yeah, and and I, I think eventually it will help Zach Wilson. Whether it's it pays off for the Jets or not, I don't know. Uh, by the time I think Rogers will stay here for two years, and and maybe longer if if he's healthy and they're winning. I mean, he can be Brady as long as it's not one. If he walks away after one. I may well, have to turn him. Well, how about how course. about this is it's the worst case scenario for the Jets, and you know, as Jet fans, you guys always think worst case. Of so course, people, why not? Fifty years. So they got to get. First of all, they flip ones, which might have hurt them, even though they say they weren't going to take. It was a Broderick Jones from Georgia. Oh, they, it, uh, perfectly fine. They got a guy named McDonald. He's going to turn into a okay, star. Yeah, mark yeah, well, mark it down. Yeah. But the clause for next year, it's uh, it's a two that goes to one if he pays six, plays 65%. So imagine this. Uh, Rogers plays 69%. The Jets are 7-10, and 10, and he retires. Oh. And the two still goes to yeah. a one. You got uh, you got yeah. Jody looking towards the sky. He's looking for that other shoe to drop. They're, the they're too good to be seven and ten. They're not going to be. Seven well, you would ten. think so, but I'm just saying if he barely passes the threshold of the sixty five percent, the Jets don't make the playoffs. All right. Well, what could happen, and it's a legit, you get to that sixty some odd percent, the number is achieved. Oh, and then he breaks his leg. And then Zach Wilson comes in. They're seven and four on the way to seven and ten because Zach comes in at that point. Yeah, that could happen. That that's you, typical Jets. Uh, yeah, you've been yeah, following. I get that. You've been following this team for too long. I mean, <laughs> you know. Yes, I have. All right, so uh, Gary, one more Eagle question before we let you run, and we appreciate you hopping on board. Last year, fourteen and three, tied in the Super Bowl with ten seconds to go. If they're going to improve on that, it's pretty damn hard. That's high <laughs> aspirations. How does Nick Sirianni manage that in the locker room? With the guys who were there, the new guys are going to come in. They're going to be hungry. The dogs will be fine because they're used to winning championships. So their level is high. They they had to win a championship to improve on the previous year. Oh, they did that. So uh, they, they certainly know what's ahead of them. What is the mantra of Nick Sirianni coming into the year? Just be the best that you can be and let the chips fall where they may? Because yeah. there are some Eagle fans that are setting the expectations higher than that. Yeah, I, I think what he should do is say, you know, we were this close last year. Let's finish it off. Um, I, I think it not only is it hard for a Super Bowl champion to repeat, but if you look at the history of Super Bowl losers getting back to the Super Bowl the next year, it's, it obviously has happened. I mean, Buffalo did it three years in a row. They got back after they lost. Um, and there have been other teams that have done it. But it's not like an automatic that you get to pick up where you left off. Because I think psychologically, and especially as close as the Eagles came to winning that game, I think emotionally and psychologically, you go, oh, I, we expended so much energy and so many things had a break right, including Brock Purdy, you know, basically his elbow falling off in the championship game For, to even get to that point where they had a chance to win the Super Bowl. Can we get geared back up to, to work hard enough to get to that spot? And I, I think that's the hardest thing for coaches to convince their players of. Yes, it's worth it. Look how close we came and we didn't get the ring. Of course we had a great season, but it was the hardest loss any team has is losing in the Super Bowl, especially, you know, teams get blown out in the Super Bowl. Ah, we didn't have a chance in that game. We were just outclassed. Yeah. But yeah. they stood toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They, they, the, the quarterback outplayed – Hurts outplayed Mahomes in that game. It was a terrible pass interference call, defensive holding, whatever it was, um, that cost them a chance to get that game into OT. Um I think it's. I think that's his biggest job right now is convincing the players. Let's finish it off, and we got to put forth the same effort that we did last year 
just to get back to that point of putting us in a position to win it that we couldn't do last year. And I think that's his biggest challenge. And, and again, if you look year by year at the teams that have lost the Super Bowl, there aren't that many that get back the next year with a chance to win it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's difficult. The human nature aspect of yeah, it. You're absolutely. correct, Gary. At Gary Myers NY, make sure you follow uh, Gary on Twitter, Amazon.com to get Once a Giant, a story of victory, tragedy, and life after football. The great, what, 86 team, right, Gary? Uh, yeah, I, John, I just want to say this. I know you have a lot of Eagle fans, obviously, watching this. And I don't want them to look at it and say, ah, I don't want to read about the Giants. And I understand that to a certain extent. But this book really transcends the Giants. I just use this team because I wanted to focus on one team. And this was such a popular team in New York and had so many big names. But I really use this team to tell the story of what happens to players in the 50s and 60s. So I just as easily could have used the 86 Eagles or the 85 Eagles or the 85 Bears or whatever. I chose this team because, you know, I live in New York. I know all these guys. It was a very popular team, and it was exactly the age group I wanted to write about. But the stories in here, while they might be unique to each individual, players around the league on every team from that era are facing the same issues and have experienced the same issues. So where I'm talking about Taylor and Sims and Burt and Bavaro and Parcells and Belichick, et cetera, it very easily could be, you know, name all the players from the 86 Eagles and they would have very similar stories to tell. So if you're interested in what I think is the most important issue facing players of yesterday, today and tomorrow, which is what is their life going to be like in the 50s and 60s? This book really tells you what you need to know about that. And there are just there are heartwarming stories in here and there are heartbreaking stories in here. Gary, very much looking forward to reading it. We're looking forward to having you back on in a couple of months. Thanks for jumping in with us today. Always a pleasure, bud. Thanks. Yeah, it's always fun with you guys. Take care. Thanks, Gary. Gary Myers here with us on Birds 365. All right, running late. Come back. Go put a bow on the show. Wrap up this edition of Birds 365.